I admit I wondered a few times, why was I building rapport with this person, a criminal who'd murdered two boyfriends, and whose husband died in a suspicious home accident? Plus, there was her questionable mental state. Listen, you're an angel of mercy, you really are. I don't know, it's just like, I really do appreciate from the bottom of my heart everything you've done, and those books really do distract me from this whole here. Real Crime Profile is brought to you by many sponsors who support our podcast, from Casper mattresses to Quip toothbrushes to Madison Reed hair color to Sun Basket to so many others. So please, when you hear our sponsor, do check out the promo codes and the special offers for our listeners, and also go to realcrimeprofile.com where you can get up to date information on our latest sponsors and the latest special offers they have for our listeners. Remember, we can't do this without you, and we certainly can't do it without our sponsors. So thank you all for supporting Real Crime Profile. Marge mentioned Brian Wells. It's not like we didn't measure his neck for the collar. It wasn't a dramatic thing. It was just another sentence to her. And Kelly and I shot each other a look at that time. And I got up and walked away from the table. And Kelly came up behind me, you know, a little bit later. I was just kind of pacing the room. We weren't allowed to do much of anything else. And I was just kind of walking around the room, and Kelly came up, and she goes, did you hear what she just said? And I looked at her, and I said, about measuring Brian Wells for the collar? Yes, I did. I said, and I don't want to know anymore. I absolutely believe that Marjorie Dill Armstrong is the mastermind behind the Brian Wells killing. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. This is Jim Clemente, former New York City prosecutor, retired FBI profiler, and writer-producer of CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me today in the studio is... Laura Richards, former criminal behavioral analyst, New Scotland Yard, and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service. And I'm Lisa Zambetti. I'm the casting director for CBS's Criminal Minds, where I cast victims, FBI agents, psychopaths, everything in between. Well, today we're with our very... Favorite special guest? Favorite and special. I like that. Jim Fitzgerald here, retired profiler and current forensic linguist, consultant, author, all those things. Great to be back with you guys. Well, we are talking about what is one of the most groundbreaking series that we've watched because it was so intricate and so engaging. And in four short hours. It was four episodes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, which isn't a huge amount. No, it isn't, but it, there's so much that happens in that four short hours that it just really blew us away. So we're so happy that our listeners suggested it. And we're going to wrap up our coverage of this series today with Jim Fitzgerald. And so much behavior. That's the thing that I kept, I couldn't wait to talk about with you guys because there's just so much, you know, primary source footage of the suspects, all of the crazy, bizarre and macabre suspects and scenarios in this. But yeah, so we're going to be heading into episode three and four of Evil Genius. And this is where we sort of really get the POV of the filmmaker who spent about 15 years following this case and basically following Marjorie Deal Armstrong, Trey Borzieleri. Um, began a relationship basically with Marjorie and has procured really the only interview that she ever directly gave because he set her up with an attorney and she Skypes with his attorney and this poor attorney, <laughs> I mean, he's the look on his face, you know, as she's talking to him, he's like, what have I gotten myself into? But she just spews forth everything about what what's happened and and what she thinks and and they try to get her to really uh tell them all the details about brian wells but she uh she strings them along for like the better part of a decade wouldn't you say guys yeah and that's that's the kind of thing that when you look at this documentary series the time span that it covers i mean this is a real commitment on the part of these documentarians they obviously knew that this was a very important case, but they could never have known where it would go over the mm -hmm. course of this decade. Yeah, nobody had been aware of Marjorie. In the whole pizza, I mean, that thing made international news, but Trey was the only one who, like, kept asking questions and, and really 
made contact with Marjorie all this time. She was not, other than a local oddball, um, was not known. And of course, we're hoping to get Trey on, you mm -hmm. know, Trey and Barbara, actually, mm -hmm. so that we can discuss with them this incredible piece of work, a 10-year documentary in the making. So Fitz, let's dive back in then with, uh, is there anything else from you just in terms of either the letter or just some as the um, investigation that was unfolding that is key that perhaps wasn't in the documentary? Well, I want to give a, a shout out to um, uh, the investigators also involved in this case who stuck with it, uh, FBI, New York State Police and, and uh, Erie PD. Um, I mean, they had an unprecedented case you know, that, that fell into their uh, laps uh, in, in August of uh, 2003. And, uh, and to their credit, it took them time, too, to put this together. But, uh, but they eventually did. So, um, so these are the local investigators, or do you mean like FBI? Because we obviously hear more from Jerry in the documentary from the FBI. And Jason Wick, who's part of the ATF. There was, it seemed like a big task force that was... Yeah, it was a big task force, and it sounded like they worked together very well. And uh, they were very committed to this. And uh, again, dealing with, like you said, Laura Oddball and, and bizarre people with all kinds of personality issues uh, among them individually, collectively. So, you know, to their credit, and I, I think to follow up what you said, uh, it, it is a great miniseries. Trey did a good job there. Um, but of course, it, it, it had to be the police that, you know, put the basic aspects of it together, police and law enforcement together that did this, uh, a, a very confusing case. And um, yeah, as far as my role, um, after the initial few uh, uh, assessments of, of uh, the letter, and actually I consider them plural letters in this case, uh, uh, my role was sort of minimized after that. I, I even think the role of, uh, of the profiling unit was minimized from that point on. And it was mostly gumshoe uh, investigative work and, and dealing with these individual people and trying to just figure out which one of them was the weakest link, would, which one would give them the most information that could finally put this matter to arrest and figure out not just, you know, A to Z, but, you know, all the letters in between in terms of who did what. And that's what they did. And I'm sure the FBI profilers offered up more than that he, he, whoever he is, was probably a handyman because of the timers and the device. Right. And, um, uh, you know, there were issues in there and I helped, you know, put this, uh, the profile together early on. You know, he was a manipulator, uh, uh, you know, he, the pre-offense, post-offense factors would kick in. But that always is more difficult in determining what's unusual in the pre-offense behavior of a person in a post-offense if the only people they associate with are other people involved in the same crime. So that made that a little bit more tricky. They really seemed to have no other outside associations, or if they were, it was very minimal stopping in a store or something like that. So um, uh, so these are the things that we as profilers tried to put together, along with trying to give our best assessment of this particular uh, communication. And what I did keep asking early on, I said, give me other copies of communications of letters written by these people, but it just didn't, uh, they never got those documents to me. I was just going to ask that because Trey, the documentarian, had boxes and boxes of letters from Marjorie, and I was just, it just occurred to me, did anybody ever compare her letters to the original uh, scavenger hunt pages? No, and every once in a while, Lisa, in different cases I've worked over the years, and I'm kind of ashamed to admit this, although I tried my best, but Jim knows about the anthrax case. I begged to be put on that task force. I said, give me writings of, we know whoever did the anthrax case was a biochemist somewhere involved in the U.S. Army research. I said, give me known writings of all these people. We have writings in this case. I mean, it worked in Unibom. It worked with Eric Rudolph in the uh, Atlanta bombings, the Olympics. Um, but um, anthrax kind of put me aside. And I'm not going to blame anybody in this case. Uh, it moved on in so many different directions. And of course, I had other cases come my way. But I really think that the, and I know I told them early on that there's some distinctive features in these uh, documents, some stylistic features, some spelling features. I would love to have, ask them to spell decipher and see if they got that spelt right, or uh, write die pack and see how they spelled it individually. And that's not even looking for handwriting, just lexical features of the different language usage here. So, um, so after the profile and my initial assessment in this, um, 
like most of the rest of America, I was just more or less following this pretty much from afar. And, um, and the whole profiling unit basically uh, wasn't all that involved, I don't think, as it moved on towards its uh, conclusion. Well, Fitz, in this documentary, they start revealing things like jailhouse informants, statements, uh, people that were in jail with Marjorie who said that she claimed that she said, it's not like we didn't measure his neck for the collar and, <sighs> and that Marjorie admitted to this cellmate that she shot James Roden because he was going to rat on them about the pizza bombing case. James Roden, though, was murdered before the actual bank robbery and the bombing murder of Brian Wells. Can I ask you something about um, FBI agent Jerry Clark and James Wick, who is the ATF? They, they look like two guys who were just obsessed with this case. I mean, there's something about them that, and the way that she manipulated them, just kind of stringing them along, making them drive her all over the place and get her into another facility. I mean... How do you protect yourself from that kind of manipulation when you're an agent? It seems like they were just putty in her hands. She just oh, like, well, they you have to go along with it, right? You have to go along with it because you know that in the end, what your goal is is to get a conviction. Not you know, you don't care what she's doing and what she's making you do. I mean, if you're if it's not you know illegal or outrageous, then you just go along with it because sometimes, as you found, Jim, when you were dealing with Ted Kaczynski, sometimes they'll manipulate you and not give you anything and you have to take that chance right well i actually had minimal interactions with kaczynski my 2007 attempted interview of kaczynski that was a form of manipulation it was all set up and then an hour away uh, he told me he was busy that day so that was his little way of uh, getting back at uh, uh one of the people responsible for his arrest but we certainly see that here with the agents and you're right jim and uh, it's always a cost-benefit analysis you have to do when you're dealing with people like this that you know have information, that you know can break open a case, whether they're the prime suspects or somebody else, and you sometimes have to sort of uh, bend over a little bit backwards to give them what they want and, uh, and take them to the next place. I don't always mean physically, but in their head that they think they're getting something from it. But I always try to make sure it was a quid pro quo when I was uh, doing things like that. I'll always make sure I get something first, and if you reward me, I'll reward you back. I'm the one in charge here, not you. If they want to think they're manipulating me, that's fine. I think the agents uh, involved in this case, uh, you know, they, they played along with Marjorie to some degree because they had a, they had a higher goal and a, a, a goal that was more important to them than exactly where she was being confined at the time. So I think they played the game pretty well. It's always a chess game, Jim and Laura and Lisa, as you know when you're dealing with people such as this. And uh, the brighter they are, the more dimensions you have to that chess game, and you have to work around it every way you can. So all about power and control. Yeah, it is. On multiple levels, too, yes. Absolutely. walk down the toothbrush aisle at the store, it doesn't take long to realize there are lots of options, and many of them are just gimmicks. Truth is, you really just need something that guides the simple habits most of us get wrong when brushing our teeth, and Quip knows that. Quip is designed to last, covered for the life of your plan, and you can return for up to 30 days if it's not love at first brush. Quip was called the best electric toothbrush by GQ and the Tesla of toothbrushes by Bloomberg. With Quip, you don't have to worry about getting new brush heads or toothpaste. They're delivered right to your door on schedule. So you replace your brush on time and have better oral hygiene at an affordable price with the sleekest design you've ever seen for an electric toothbrush. Quip will even give you tips on oral care that you probably never knew. Quip toothpaste tastes fresh, strengthens teeth, and gives your mouth the perfect minty clean feeling. Its wireless mirror mount declutters your bathroom and doubles as a travel cover. So it's the easiest and most refreshing travel companion. Quip's subscription model is a thoughtful, inexpensive solution for people who want to make it easy to keep up with the simple habits that will improve their oral health. Let Quip do the thinking for you when it comes to your teeth. No charger or wires means Quip is compact and light. 
to make brushing twice daily easy at home and on the go. Quip starts at just $25. And if you go to getquip.com slash real crime right now, you'll get your first refill pack free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at getquip.com slash real crime. Spelled G E T Q U I P dot com slash real crime. A few weeks after Marjorie asked the FBI to move her to a prison closer to Erie, they actually arranged for a transfer, anticipating she'd provide new information about the heist. But she didn't. She just kept implicating Bill Rothstein. She brought up about the pizza bomber. She said, I know Bill Rothstein's involved in it. She didn't say, I believe he's involved. She said, I know he's involved. So I think of all of the mistakes that were made in this whole conspiracy, in this whole case, this whole plan, I think one that that Marjorie made actually really revealed that that she was actually involved in, in not only the Brian Wells robbery murder but also in other aspects of this crime that marjorie said that bill rothstein requested two kitchen timers from her now when the police released details about this device to the public they did not put in that there were two kitchen timers in the device so that's one of those aspects that we hold back to verify whether somebody who's confessing is actually telling the truth or not. So by saying that Bill Rothstein had requested two kitchen timers and it was two kitchen timers in the device, I think she very well implicated herself as well as Bill Rothstein in the creation of that device, the creation of this entire scheme. And I think that that is... That was something that she didn't know she was doing when she said it. She thought she was just implicating him, Mm -hmm. but in fact, what it did was implicated her as well. Yeah, that was a very important factor. And uh, I've been in that situation before. And we should also add here, which I don't think we did in earlier episodes. We also, I encouraged a publication of the letter or at least portions of it. And there was a redacted version within a week or two uh, of the robbery, uh, homicide, bombing, uh, that the public was asked to look at. But unfortunately, in that case, um, you know, because the writing style was so distinctive and quite frankly unique that uh, no no positive leads came out of that. But, uh, but yeah, but in, in situations where there's signature information, or I should say singular information, that only the victim knows, who may or may not be alive, in this case he wasn't, and the offender knows, uh, what you as an officer or investigator have to make sure Jim, and I know you know this, is that in fact, that information never was released. So I remember having some conversation down the line in this case about, you know, well, did anybody put out the fact that two timers were, uh, you know, inside the device? Was it in the media? Was it during one of the interviews? And I remember hearing that the agents had to go back and double check, do all all kinds of Google searches to make sure, you know, the word two timers, uh, meaning two kitchen type timers, were, were never actually listed in the case. So that did become a very valuable piece of evidence. And you're correct in that uh, that was probably the biggest mistake Marjorie made, as intelligent as she may be and as uh, manipulative, that was a slip up and that certainly led to her downfall. And so was the, the letter, the handwriting, was that ever put out there at the time of the investigation? You requested that it should be. You said a redacted version? Yes, it was ultimately published uh, online as well as in various newspapers and on television. I remember seeing it a few weeks later. And, um, you know, they, they did the best they could. They, they blacked out some parts. And there's like maybe one whole page, maybe half of it was blacked out just to give the general public an idea of, um, uh, of what this writing style looked like. And I believe there were a couple of requests. I forget exactly what letter they put out. I think it's online somewhere. But uh, the bottom line is uh, where it did work in the Unibomb case and another bombing case I worked uh, actually in 2003, the, the Midwest bomber, we published a document he wrote and we got him identified uh, in this particular case. Uh, uh, it it bore, no, uh, bore no fruit for us, but it's something we had to do anyway 
uh, from an investigative strategy perspective. Yeah, well, Fitz, I remember when the case came in and having sort of a tangential connection to it. I sat in on the consult. I believe it was before the whole team came in from Erie, Pennsylvania. But I know that in, then in 2005, I was out for medical reasons when a lot changed in this case, when a lot of new information came out and, and basically it was a sea change in terms of the investigation. I think it was because of that comment by Marjorie that mm -hmm. Bill Rothstein actually killed Brian Wells. You, you mentioned just about the two years. And so some of the new things, uh, the new clues was obviously Marjorie driving on the highway, driving the wrong way which was called in, but apparently no one interviewed her or the, the witness who called that in. So again, when we think about pre and post offense behavior, right. I mean, the blue truck, the again, that we saw, the two, blue van that we saw when Trey pulls up to the house, that's clearly outside Bill's. Right. And then you've got Marjorie, you know, driving in a, you know, bizarre fashion, the wrong way of, of the highway, and yet that wasn't picked up on even though it was called in. Right, and then she was seen at the gas station with Bill Rothstein um, at the phone where the call was made in to order the pizzas Right. at the time that the call was made. So again, major mistake. Luckily, I think it was a UPS driver. And yeah. what I know about UPS drivers is that they are incredibly meticulous about timing, that they actually are only given a certain amount of time to do their job every day, to deliver each package. They get rated on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Every day is broken down into minute little time units that they have to account for. They have to account for getting a drink of water, really? going to the bathroom. Yes, yeah. it's, it's an amazingly controlling environment to work within. And they don't, by the way, just in case you see them driving with their doors open, they don't have air conditioning in those brown vans. And we know two things. Dark vans are going to attract heat, right? And the tops of the vans, in order to save money, instead of having lights in the back, they have basically a, uh, a translucent kind of... A skylight. Skylight, right. Mm -hmm. And so that lets the sunlight in so they don't have to keep turning on lights and so forth and so on. And the fact is that that is an oven in those trucks. Aww, so, <laughs> yeah, well, just a little details, a little side note. They're allowed to wear shorts, though. That's a good thing. Yes, there you go. Not completely inhumane, then. <laughs> yes. But anyway, that's why they drive with their doors open most of the time. So this UPS driver saw her with Bill at that location at that time, and that was a critical piece of evidence tying them to the entire bank robbery murder scheme. Can I comment real quick about the genius of how this documentary is laid out, though? Because Ken Barnes, at the very end, comes to become a, a very significant witness in this case. But in the beginning, he's just set up as like, oh, the fishing buddy of Marjorie, and he just seems like a local yokel, and you'd never imagine that he's involved in this. And then, it, but by the end, he is deep in it and she, he takes this uh, you know Marjorie is already serving uh, her time for James Roden's murder but then they have enough to put her on trial for the bank robbery too and and they put oh, what did you think about this they put her through psychiatric evaluation, evaluation and deem that she's competent well, to serve i mean to get up and they they deem that she wasn't but then gave her a course of therapy and medication and at some point then they did believe that she was qualified so that was a process, and mm -hmm. that is a legitimate process, because mm -hmm. if you can't assist in your own defense, then they can't try you. But once you are capable of doing that, you haven't exonerated yourself from the crime. So you still have to face the music if you're charged. So I believe that's what ha happened. And what Ken Bards did was he attributed a motive to Marjorie. And that was that she wanted to get rid of her father because she wanted to get her inheritance from him. And apparently he had been doing nice things around the community and helping people and giving money to people. And she thought he was wasting it away. And, and she'd have her house broken into and lost a load of money, right? right. Well, that's what that's, she yeah, was said by Ken Barnes. Right. And that... She wanted, uh, she offered to pay him $250,000 to kill her father. And her father actually says that he heard rumors about that, but, you know, whether that actually proves it or not, I don't know. But Marjorie's defense, and this is 
Fitz, I want you to weigh in on this. This is something we see. It's the kind of statement that actually implicates somebody when they're trying to exonerate themselves. She said, I killed two boyfriends. It was in self-defense. Would I have to hire Ken Barnes to kill my dad? Well, it's not like she's saying, I don't want to kill my dad. Uh, if I, if she's saying, if I wanted to kill my dad, I would kill myself. I could kill him. I could kill people. I could, I've killed two men before. So the point is that she's not really actually giving herself really a, any kind of help here by making a statement like that. It, it sounds like she's the kind of person that would kill her dad. So if she is that kind of person, it's not a far leap to say that she'd want to hire somebody to do it. Right, but this is what we're saying, that if that's what she wanted, if she really, her motive was the money, they went about it completely ass backwards. So that's what I'm saying. Like They're maybe not she sophisticated did, but, criminals. But maybe she didn't realize that she would never get this money, but Bill Rostin was like, you're not getting this. I want to see this guy killed. Yeah, or, you, you know? it, it may be a secondary motive that he, he Bill Rothstein, cooked up in the process. I don't think Marjorie, in any way, shape, or form, built the device or had had really any... There's no proof that she had any participation in actually putting this device together. Other than the timers or whatever. Except giving well, the Giving the them timers. to him, but he was a handyman. He did lots of practical things, and it all indicated him. But didn't the brother also say about the ham writing looked like Bill's? Right, and also there the was... Friend, yeah. The best there was, friend. Yeah. There was right. one forensic detail in the letter that was non-linguistic, and that was a an arrow that went up and then turned... Um, and there was a diagram on Bill's desk that had the same kind of arrow in it. And it's just, it's just a, a feature that, that was consistent and may have indicated that he actually drew some of the diagrams in this nine-page ridiculous tome. Right, but it was the brother that was shocked who thought that it just couldn't have been Bill, but the best friend said it was his handwriting. Mm. So Fitz, do you have any closing comments on this case? Yeah, just that I, I can't claim any true credit for helping to solve this case or anything, but I did play a little bit of a role in it, starting with the linguistic analysis of these letters. And uh, this was one of the more fascinating cases I ever worked. I thought the Evil Genius documentary did a great job in capturing it. And the one thing at least we didn't mention in, in my time here is uh, the expression that was laid out a few times in the letter, and that was to uh, the words of uh, uh, the warnings for Brian Wells, Act now, think later, or you will die. Well, guess what? He acted, I'm sure he thought, and he still died. And um, I guess there are words we can live by somewhat and, uh, and uh, put this uh, case finally to rest. So thanks for having me on board, guys, and um, I uh, hope your listeners appreciate it. Uh, you always come with a different perspective. There are many things that you see that, that we're not even aware of, and I'm sure our listeners really appreciate that. Thank you so much for your insights, and I'm sure that there will be another case in the near future that we'll be calling you up to come back and opine on. Count me in, guys. Bye, Fitz. Great to have you on, Fitz. All right, see you next time. All right, take care. I believe she said there was another person involved with him and that he was keeping really close to the case and he was like infatuated with the case so he knew more than what the police did in case he got talked to on it now i couldn't get her to give me you know why she knew marjorie how do you know this information she didn't she wouldn't give that up she controlled the interview because it was very easy for her all she had to do was walk away or say i'm not talking anymore So speaking of Barnes, um, he gets up on the stand at Marjorie's trial and he just sings like a canary. I mean, he tells the whole thing, you know, whether we believe 100 percent or not. But he says that the whole thing was they lured in Brian Wells via his his friend, Jessica Hoopsick, you know, who's a prostitute and he paid her in drugs. And anyway, so Brian was in debt to some drug dealers. And so he was a willing participant in this crime as far as he thought it was a fake bomb and then at the end of the day they switched it on him and forced him into a real bomb collar right um, and i think that that is consistent with the behavior that we saw of yeah. brian when he went into the bank 
when he strolled around when he left, when he grabbed a lollipop, when he sat handcuffed on the street and did not get irate that the police were treating him like a bad guy, did not demand that they do something to protect him, did not, like, I mean, why wouldn't you just get a, uh, you know, one of those things that the firemen have that, that cuts the, metal. Of life, yeah. yeah. Of life, yeah. And, and jaws of life, right. Yeah. And, and just cut it off, snap it off. I mean, it could have been done. It would have been expeditious. You could have gotten him separated. You could kept, keep him arrested, but you could have at least saved his life. But to me, the most significant thing is his lie. His lie about these black men who forced him to do this. That lie just sticks with me and just... I don't know. For me, that is just damning. Okay. The only thing that might cut against that mm -hmm. is the fact that if he did, if he was a completely innocent victim in this, and they said, look, we're going to be listening to what you say and do, mm -hmm. and if you tell them that it's us, we're going to blow this up immediately. That would have kept him sure. quiet, and it would have kept him. Yeah. And so it is possible that that's what they said. But given all the circumstances, my feeling is that he was a willing participant to a point. He probably thought that it was a fake bomb, that he was not going to die, that this was all a ruse. Um, I don't believe that he knew that he had this one hour and he was going to be killed. So I do believe that he was murdered. And whether you call it a felony murder and that it is a murder that occurred in the course of a commission of a felony, or you call it a premeditated murder. I'm not sure what it was, but I think that the other people involved, Bill Rothstein, Ken Barnes, Floyd, Floyd Stout, yeah. um, and, uh, you know, maybe even other people <laughs> were involved, and I think they should all be prosecuted for his murder. Anybody that was involved in this conspiracy just because there's a possibility that the victim was also involved in conspiracy doesn't mean that they didn't commit a murder they did commit a murder right and it was a deliberate act they built this bomb and it was an anti-personnel bomb i mean it was meant to kill him and it did in fact kill him so i think more people should be in jail because of this murder and i do believe i am embarrassed by the statements that came out of the FBI about the innocence of Bill Rothstein. I believe there's plenty of information to inculpate him. And as Laura pointed out earlier, I do believe there was an imbalance in justice. I don't believe he was treated the same way that Marjorie was treated. I think she was treated as a real ki killer and criminal, which she may very well be. But I believe that Bill Rothstein was just as culpable right. and just as involved, if not more involved. I believe he was definitely more involved in building the device itself. She seemed crazy and she seemed like she would be a mastermind, while it, whereas he fooled everybody. Laura, would you? Yeah, I'm going to weigh on this whole crazy woman thing because yeah. I it really, I just find it quite offensive, uh, namely because. You know, I think Bill Rothstein tried to set that tone. And I think that he, when he was being interviewed by Jerry, was kind of like, come on, you know, the kind of, you know, have you ever seen manic depressives and this kind of crazy woman theme that he plays into Jerry? And I, I think it continues down, you know, and leans down that way with her. And yet Bill seems to be remarkably unscathed by that. So... I would have liked to have seen, you know, far more balance in terms of I, I do think they're co-conspirators. I don't think that Marjorie is innocent in this, but I, I think you have to track it back and understand the kind of, you know, as you know, Jim, psychological autopsy of all the characters involved in what was going on in their life. But that doesn't mean to say that they're innocent and they've certainly taken some decisions, you know, to harm others. But I do think with Brian Wells, you know, it's my belief and I'm in a way and I do think that he was innocent. I think that he was vulnerable as a person, you know, for what, 20 odd years, he's the pizza delivery guy, you know, he's kind of 
uh, I guess, you know, childlike caricature of kind of dancing around to music as the neighbour sort of says about him and his personality. I think that he was probably easily exploited and easily exploitable. And maybe he did just go up there to deliver these pizzas and he gets brought into this kind of web of things. And yes, he could well have been coerced into, we're going to play a game, but you've got to say X, Y and Z. I don't think he knew that that was a live bomb around his neck and what they did inevitably they gave him less than an hour to live and we obviously see that on our screens what happened which which was horrific in and of itself. Mm-hmm. What we do see from Marjorie is somebody who was incredibly intelligent, bright, was magnetically beautiful when she was younger. At 23 she does go to try and seek medical help but we don't really get under what was going on in terms of her life course and even just the way that she was pictured. The evil genius has split on her face and you know the artist basically said in, in court that he kind of shaded her face really dark. This kind of caricature of of evil where perhaps she's made some bad and terrible decisions in La Folie à Deux with Bill Rothstein um, and the other characters are involved where C Seemingly, they seem to get off scot-free. And in the end, you know, Marjorie's body wasn't even claimed. She's buried in an unmarked grave. And, and I do wonder what happened to Bill Rothstein. He died in hospital, but I'm sure he's in a marked grave and seems to have been treated entirely differently. But the real victim in this is obviously Brian Wells, James Roden. Uh, there was another colleague of Brian Wells, wasn't there, who mm, suddenly the and unexpectedly yeah. died Killed before he was going to be yeah. questioned by mm-hmm. the FBI. So he's an interesting character of what was going on with him. So it seems like a number of people were involved as co-conspirators. So Evil Genius is, is probably mm-hmm. a much more accurate yeah. title. For and sure. I think that this just kind of points out the flaws in thinking about a documentary as the pure truth. Because um, as producers ourselves, I mean, we know that there are certain things that can be manipulated in in a documentary series. That if you're not incredibly conscientious about facts, that that it's very easy to go down the basically the trail that you believe in. And so that's why. Laura, we have to, when we do our documentary series, we have to literally stick with the facts. We have to let the facts tell us a story. And we don't make, you know, extreme pronunciations about things if we don't know for certain. And that's what I think some documentarians don't do. I think they they have an idea in their mind and they set out to prove it. And, you know, whether they that happens in the middle of production or at the end when they're editing, I don't know. But the fact is that there are certain things that don't seem exactly evenly portrayed in this documentary series. That's not to take away from it because it is a dynamic series. And I'm so glad that I watched it, especially because it answered questions that I have from way back in 2005 because I wasn't involved from that point forward in the case. I was just going to say that having read a lot of interviews with the documentarians, they really wanted to talk about Brian Wells and try to bring some kind of justice to nobody was ever found guilty of his death. And so that's something that was very much on their minds. Um, And I hope that we can, again, we can interview them and have them talk from their point of view. Um, And obviously it is a very subject, this particular documentary is very subjective because the documentarian was so intensely involved with Marjorie. So obviously he's She's his focus through a lot of it. But anyway, right. well, that's for another day. And it also sets it apart. And this is why I would like to speak to Trey and, and Barbara and, and have them on RCP, because obviously having a female as the centre character in this sets it apart from everything else that's on Netflix. So, you know, whether that is just a byproduct, but I, I think the lens was skewed, but I'd love to hear more from them because they're the creators of it and they can tell us a lot more. Absolutely. All right. Well... To our listeners, we're signing off for now. We really appreciate you listening, and please keep the recommendations coming because there are a lot of cases out there that we aren't exposed to. And actually, since we have a very limited time, there are some shows about cases that we haven't yet seen. So if you see anything or hear anything good, please let us know, and we will do our best to keep up with those cases Uh, in our coverage on Real Crime Profile. So thank you for listening. Till next time. Signing off for Real Crime Profile. 
If you like our podcasts, there are a few things you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotions and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go to Facebook and like our Facebook page, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Real Crime Profile without the E. And one last thing, please tell your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all of our listeners. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineering by Mike Thal. Music is composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107. Or you can go to the website where there's a lot of information and advice that you can follow on www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Helpline for free on 0800-2000-247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter or counselling, you can call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, on 214 946 4357. You can also go to their website for further advice or support, www.genesisshelter.org. And there's the Domestic Violence Hotline on 800 799 7233.